All right, so uh, let's get into it. So uh, I'm a basketball guy. Any basketball fans in the room? In the room today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was a basketball coach, trainer, PE teacher. That's what I've done for for a while now. Uh, so I'm excited that the NBA playoffs has started. Right, so we know the Warriors aren't there this year. Right, I love the Warriors, but we will have to catch them next year. Right, so uh, I've been watching the Nuggets and the Lakers. No, yeah, that's right. Yep, Nuggets and the Lakers. All right, so uh, started a few weeks ago, and uh, at the end of game two, uh, the Lakers had an opportunity to win the game, right? LeBron makes this nice move, steps back for three at the top of the key, and he misses it, misses a wide open shot. And then shortly after that, Jamal Murray uh, makes this like Kobe jordan s fade away, going right over the right shoulder, over the top of AD, and the Nuggets go crazy, right? He turned around like, I'm him, I'm the guy, I'm the GOAT, right? That's how Jamal was looking. And um, yeah, it's just... It was, you know, as soon as that happened, uh, you know, NBA Twitter just took off, right? They couldn't wait to roast LeBron, right? So they saying stuff like, oh, this is your GOAT. Jordan would have never missed that shot. Kobe would have never missed it. He doesn't have a killer mentality, right? He's not a killer. And, um, and they even started talking about his hairline. I'm like, his hairline, it had nothing to do with the shot. Like, the internet is a dangerous place. They just drag you for no reason. But I want to ask you guys, who do you think is the GOAT? All right, so anybody think Kobe is the GOAT? Kobe is the greatest of all time. Okay, we got a few SoCal people out here. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anybody think Jordan is the GOAT? Jordan is the greatest. Yeah, we got some people grew up in the 90s. Uh, we see that. And then we in the base, so I got it. Well, we got it. We can't omit LeBron. Anybody think LeBron is the GOAT? Nobody. My daughter is it. We got two. Dang, that shot ended it for him, huh? He had the conversation for real. And then uh, we in the base, so I got to ask you guys, you think Stephen Curry is the GOAT? Anybody think Steph? Dang, y'all don't like Steph? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. All right, so I think we can argue who's the GOAT all day long. We can say that who has the best stats, who impacts people the most on the court, who makes their teammates better, what do they do off the court, all those things can go into the goal and we can argue about it all day. But one place that I think we'd agree is that when we see someone operating in greatness, when we see people doing great things, something is triggering us that says, hey, I want to be great too. Right. And I might not be the greatest basketball player of all time, but I could be great in my own. Right. Right. So maybe you're a nurse. Right. And you're like, hey, I want to be the greatest nurse in my field because there's different types of nurses. Right. All right. I don't know them all, so I can't name them. But yeah, I get what I'm saying. All right. Or maybe you're an entrepreneur and you want to be the greatest entrepreneur in your niche, right? Because they say there's riches in the niches, right? I don't know about that yet. I, ain't got, I haven't got to that point. Or maybe we in the Bay, so it could be uh, you climbing that corporate ladder and you want to be a manager. Maybe you're getting your tech thing going and you got this whole plan of like, okay, uh, I'm going to do two years at Facebook, right? And then I'm going to get on LinkedIn and people are going to start recruiting me. And then I'm going to do three years at Google, Right? Yeah, see? I'm on, I'm on the right path. Am I right a little bit? I'm kind of right? All right. I'm going to stop right there while I'm kind of right. So uh, you got this whole plan. And um, we just, I think one person that really inspires me, I think we're going to put up on, on the screen. Uh, his name is Phil Handy. So Phil Handy, he's assistant coach for the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, he's a player development coach. So he develops, help people develop their skills, works with pros, uh, young phenoms, work with some of your greats, people that you would consider your greats. And Phil has a, a app. Uh, he coaches coaches and trainers. Uh, he's one of the, just one of the greatest of all time. And I really like Phil, uh, but when I saw his brand, and his brand is Be Your Own Goat, something about that just didn't sit well with me. Like, be your own goat. And it just had me thinking like, well, we all trying to be goats, right? We're trying to be great uh, at what we're doing. But if we look at our households, they seem to be getting worse. And then we look at our neighborhoods and they're also getting worse. And even our nation, as we look at our nation, the state of our nation, we, I think we'd agree that, hey, this is getting bad, right? 
So it appears as if we're, we're becoming great individually, but worse collectively. And I just began to think about that a little bit. And the question that I asked myself is that, could it be that we're focused on becoming goats when the Lord has called us to be sheep? Could it be that we become so focused on emulating celebrities that we don't want to live like Christ? And uh, we're we're gonna get into that today. I think that's a good place to pray. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we pray that as your word goes forth today, that blind eyes will see, that deaf ears will hear, that minds will be renewed according to your will. Lord, give us a desire to be less like goats and more like sheep. Lord, help us to see that pain It's a prerequisite for purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, babe. (laughs) All right, so we're going to be continuing our triumph series, and we're going to be looking at the relationship between pain and greatness. You see, what I want to communicate today is, and it's our main idea, pain is the pathway to purpose. Uh, But before I get into that, Uh, I want to look at the differences between sheep and goat. So the Lord has been putting this on my heart for a couple months, like this whole thing of like shepherds, sheep, and goat. And I'm like, what do you mean? Where are you going? So I just be, I just been researching that and we're going to get into that. But right before I do that, uh, I want to read a piece of scripture from Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 33. And it reads, when the son of man comes in his glory, And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then Jesus goes on to say that the sheep who are on his right will spend eternity with him in heaven. And then he says the goats who are on his left will spend eternity in hell. Y'all still want to be goats? No. So head is moving like, no, I want to be a goat. All right. But I'm like, what's the reference to sheep and goats? Because Jesus was intentional. He could have cho- chosen any animal. He could have chose chicken, zebras, giraffes, right? But he chose sheep and goat for a reason. So I just was trying to, I just started to like read it, read it, research. And here's what I found. We're going to go through the characteristics of sheep first. Sheep symbolize gentleness, purity, and innocence. Sheep are intelligent and affectionate. They recognize voices and can memorize up to 50 faces. Many people say sheep are stupid. Uh, We're just going to say they have no sense of direction at all. right? Kind of like me. I'm a sheep. I get lost everywhere. We live in a place for five years. I'm still getting lost going to my house. right? So they're not stupid. Just bad sense of direction. right? So here's the thing about sheep. Uh, They will follow whoever is leading them, even if they lead them off a cliff. You remember when your parents would ask you, hey, You did something your friend did. You know you weren't supposed to do it. And your parents say, hey, if they jump off a cliff, would you do it too? Right? Hopefully you didn't say yes, right? It would have been bad if you said yes. But sheep will actually do it. If one sheep jumps off the cliff, the whole, all the sheep just jumping off the cliff. Right? So, lastly, uh, they know their shepherd's voice and they follow him. What they lack in direction they make up for in loyalty. I got to say that part again. They know their shepherd's voice and they follow him. What they lack in direction, they make up for in loyalty, friendship, and voice recognition for the shepherd. Next, let's look at the characteristics of goats. Goats have some good qualities too. <laughs> they, they are intelligent, they're sensitive, playful, and quick to respond to individual attention and affection. Goats are impulsive and unpredictable. If they're not poking their heads through fences, 
They may be standing on their hind legs, stretching for those tender leaves that are just out of reach. Goats are never content with what they have. Goats are also rebellious and stubborn. They prefer to lead or go their own way. A goat follows only its own lead, creating disunity when he comes in contact with other members of the flock. Because of his independent nature, he often finds himself in contention with the shepherd for leadership of the flock, leading some astray. A goat often eats things that a sheep would avoid. They eat things that are worthless and have no value. So question for reflection today, write this down so you can reflect, talk to a friend when you leave here today. Are you living like a sheep or a goat? You see, when I read my Bible, I just get so impressed with Jesus. Like, he was so cool. Like, he was countercultural. Like, whatever culture was doing, Jesus was doing the opposite, and he made it cool. He often communicated using paradoxical truths. A paradoxical statement is a statement that seems to be void of common sense. But the more you think about it, it seems to be true. Let's get into a few of those. The world says be a goat. Jesus says be a sheep. The world says the way up is to climb the corporate ladder. Jesus says the way up is down. That he who exalts himself will be humble. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. The world says put yourself first. Jesus says the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. The world says if you want to be great, you must have power and possessions. Jesus says to be great in his kingdom, you must sacrifice and serve. Today we're going to look at the relationship between greatness and pain. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 27. And as you go in there and we're getting it on the screen, I'd like to give you guys a little bit of context. So Jesus has called the disciples, called them out from being fishermen, called them out from being tax collectors, just ordinary people say, hey, come follow me. They say, let's go. Right. They, they acted with immediate obedience and they walk with Jesus and he's teaching. He's doing parables. He's doing paradoxical statements. He's sealing the sick giving sight to the blind. He's taking a little bit of bread and he's turning it into a lot. And the disciples start to realize, hold on. He's the Messiah. This is the King of Kings. This is the Lord of Lords. This is the guy that we read about. This is the guy that the prophets wrote about all throughout this Old Testament. And we're here and we're with him. So Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they tell him, they say, you like John. You like one of the prophets. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter and Peter faction, Peter is just, he's just erratic. He just goes, right? We're going to get into that. Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God. And Jesus blesses Peter. And he said, my father in heaven had to reveal that to you. And you are the rock upon which I will build my church. So he blesses him and gives him the keys to heaven. And we pick up just in Jesus' faction, right? Blesses him, gets him excited, right? And then he goes on to predict his death. In chapter, in verse 21, it says, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. Somebody say it was necessary. And then he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, leading priests, teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, somebody say on the third day. On the third day, day, baby. On the third day, he would be raised from the dead. And that's enough. We can go home. That's the gospel, right? Jesus overcame. On the third day, he rose. But there's more. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Peter's bold. He just rebuked Jesus. 
right? And if we if Peter was in the bay, he'd be saying, Oh, mamas, this ain't never happening to you, Jesus. No religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, they don't want to see me. It's not happening, right? So that's what Peter would say. And he goes on, and Jesus said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Turn up to your neighbor and say, give up your own way. Pick up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Last verse. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. If you're taking notes, you want to write this down. Peter thought that pain was optional. Jesus knew that it was necessary. Jesus understood that the pathway to purpose is through pain. And many of us are stuck and we're unfulfilled because we avoid pain and we pursue pleasure. We have to change the way we see pain. It's not optional. It's necessary. We can't avoid pain. We must learn to prepare for it and embrace it. James, Jesus' brother, puts it this way. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity, an opportunity for a great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when you embrace it, when, you endure, when your endurance is fully developed, I'm trying to get y'all to embrace it already. You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. The great abolitionist and author Frederick Douglass put it this way. Where there is no struggle, there is no progress. For those who profess to favor freedom yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without the thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its mighty waters. That sounds crazy, right? It's crazy to think that we want the reward, but we don't want to pay the price. And right here, I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. So that way, when I start talking about y'all, it'll be okay. Right? Y'all won't be too mad at me. There's some things that I want that I don't want to pay for. Right? One of them is I want a six-pack. Your boy want to get shredded. I'm trying to get shredded. I made a bet with me. Me, I'm going to be shredded by the end of the summer. She like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right, dad. So I want that six-pack. But I don't want to eat right. And I don't want to cook nothing. <laughs> right? I don't want to meal prep, none of that, right? And then there's also uh, another thing that I want. I want to do ministry and business full time. But, <laughs> y'all like laughing at the butt. <laughs> but I don't want to have to plan years in advance and live my whole life in Google Calendar. I also don't want to give up the security, the false security of a salary that comes with a job. All right, I talked about me, now I'm gonna talk about y'all. We're here now, right? That's fair, right? I think, I think that's fair. All right, so y'all want a healthy marriage, but you don't want to be celibate, and you don't want to go to counseling. And there's people in your phone that the Lord told you to stop talking to. And you keep texting them anyway. You want to be financially free, but you don't give. You don't store what you have well, and you scared to invest. And y'all can't outsave inflation. Y'all know that, right? You can't say you can't outsave inflation. But the reason you're scared to invest is because you refuse to get a financial education. And lastly, you want to know, you want to hear the voice of God. You want to know his plans for you, but you don't want to read your Bible. Mm. Yeah. All right, I want to move on before y'all get mad at me, you know. I don't want y'all to get too mad. I'm going to move on. 
All right, so point number one, write this down. Pain is not optional. It's necessary. The pathway to purpose is through pain. We can't avoid pain. We must, per- we must learn to prepare for it and embrace it. Let's get back into the scriptures. Uh, we'll pick up at verse 22. And it says, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such thing. Peter is bold. He just rebuked Jesus. He says, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Oh, mama. (laughs) Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view. Not from God's. All right. When I started reading that, I'm like, ooh, it's getting spicy. Like, it's going down right here. Uh, Peter is crazy. He just rebuked Jesus. All right. Peter's crazy, but we are too, because sometimes we think we know better than Jesus. So he rebukes Jesus, and then Jesus turns around, and he rebukes him back, and then it's his rebuke. He calls him Satan. Now, if we friends, you can call me a lot of things. <laughs> But don't call me Satan. You calling me a deceiver, a liar. There's no truth in me. Don't call me Satan. So I felt like that was like a strong rebuke. But as, we, as I started to study a little bit, I, I realized why Jesus said that. So the first question is, why did Peter rebuke Jesus? Peter rebuked Jesus for two reasons. Peter doesn't want to die he doesn't want Jesus to die because Jesus is his friend. Peter is loyal, right? So he's, yeah, he, he's kind of, Peter was kind of street. Like he kind of from the hood a little bit, right? So he like, hey, if you fight, I'm fine. Like if they try you, they try me. So Sadducees, leaders, religious leaders, whatever. It ain't going down like that. So he's trying to defend his friend. That's one reason. But Peter also rebuked Jesus for another reason. Peter is thinking about the earthly kingdom that he thought Jesus came to establish. Peter used to be a fisherman. Now, fisherman, that was a business, right? He had people under him, right? He was working with the people. I read a little bit. Peter had a boat and Peter had a house. So Peter was ambitious. He wasn't just like low, 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 like low, right? He was ambitious, probably like a little middle, like middle class, right? But Jesus, now Peter's with Jesus and he's saying, oh, this is the Messiah. When he speaks, things move, right? He's giving sight to the blind. He's healing people. Crowds are following him. And and Peter Peter is trying to protect his own best interests. He's trying to protect his position in the earthly kingdom. So Peter's thinking if Jesus is the king of kings, the king of the Jews, the Lord of lords, then in this earthly kingdom, I got to at least be a prince. (laughs) I got to be a duke or some. Like some, I got to have some level of authority, right? And Peter like, Jesus, you cannot die because if you die, I got to go back to fishing, (laughs) Men in the nets and waiting no fish to come up. Like Peter, like, nah, Jesus, you can't die. Right? So that's why Peter rebuked Jesus. But the next question is, why did Jesus rebuke Peter? He also rebuked him for two reasons. The first reason is because Peter is trying to protect Jesus from pain he was predestined to endure. Jesus knew that he couldn't fulfill his purpose without experiencing the pain of death. Quick, quick note for my parents and leaders. You can't protect your people from everything. It's just no way. Some of the pain is predestined. They got to experience it. And after they experience it, they're going to be better for it. They're going to have more endurance and faith. And they're going to learn to go to God when they can't go to you. And the second reason Jesus rebuked Peter is because he communicated the same message that Satan did when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. The message was that Jesus could achieve greatness without dying. That Jesus could achieve greatness without going to the cross for you and I. 
That's why Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Let's go to it. Uh, So we're going to Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. And it says, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give it all to you if you will kneel down and worship me. And Jesus says, get out of here, Satan. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Satan and Peter communicated the same message. This is why it's important for you to have a relationship with Jesus for yourself. Because sometimes us church people, we get it wrong. The message that they both communicated was that you can, and I believe the enemy is trying to get us to believe the same lie and message today. And that message is that you can avoid the pain of suffering of the cross by taking a shortcut. Just put your will before God's will. And you can have pleasure, possessions, and power right now. Just turn from serving God and serve yourself. If you write notes, write this down. When we avoid pain by taking shortcuts and going our own way, we come into agreement with Satan. We forfeit our purpose and we rob God of his glory. You see, in the text here, Peter was driven by selfish ambition. Jesus was driven by selfless obedience. Another question for reflection when you go to lunch. uh, What are you driven by? See, greatness from a human point of view and greatness from God's point of view are two different things. I'm going to look at, so really quickly, we're going to look at Peter's goat-like perspective, and we'll also look at Jesus' sheep-like perspective. Peter says, I must protect my friend and myself from pain. Jesus says, I must endure pain to fulfill my purpose and save the world. Peter says, I must secure my role in the nation of Israel. Jesus says, If you want to be my friend, you must experience pain and you must be obedient to my father in heaven. Jesus was trying to secure his place in heaven. Peter says Jesus came to save the nation of Israel from the Roman Empire. Jesus says, I came to save the world from sin. So this is where I'm trying to get to with that. It's my second point. You can write it. Greatness in the world and greatness in the kingdom are two totally different things. Greatness in the world is characterized by avoiding pain and suffering while pursuing pleasure, possessions, and power, along with personal achievement for worldly gain. Greatness in the kingdom is embracing pain to fulfill the purpose of the one who sent you. It's being willing to suffer, sacrifice, and serve others for a heavenly reward. And as as I start to wrap wrap things up a bit, uh, we're going to look at Matthew. We're going to go back to Matthew, and we're going to pick up at verse 24. Here's what Jesus says next. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Turn to your neighbor and say, give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? But lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? So uh, in this passage of scripture, uh, Jesus is telling the disciples, like, y'all see me do miracles, signs, wonders. Y'all with me, y'all excited to be with me. But this ain't going to be sweet. Just because you gave your life, you following me, that don't mean you don't have pain. 
It doesn't mean that you won't have trials. And some of us have this false belief that once I say yes to Jesus, everything is going to go well. That's bad theology. Jesus said, if you want to if you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to leave your own way. You're going to have to take up your cross. Right. And the disciples knew what he meant when he said cross. A cross was symbolic of a criminal's death. That means you're going to be have to willing to be talked about. You're going to have to be willing to be lied on. You got to be willing to be embarrassed. Right. So what we do, this is what we do. And I didn't have this in my notes, but we want to take part in God's glory. But not in his suffering. And Romans chapter eight says that. What we suffer now, meaning we have to take part in the suffering, is nothing compared to the glory that he'll reveal to us later. So what Jesus, this is what Jesus is saying. This is my third point. Jesus is saying that if you want to be a real disciple, you're going to have to make a real commitment. And that commitment is going to cost you something. In fact, it's going to cost you everything. Yeah, and this is just the place, if I'm being honest, this is the place that I am in my life. The Lord is just saying, Corey, you've been dabbling. You've been like one foot in, one foot out, halfway in what I told you to do, halfway not. And in this season, if you're going to become who I created you to be, you're going to have to commit. And I'll get into a personal story for me. So, um, I think some of you guys know that I was a basketball coach, PE teacher, and a basketball trainer around this time last year. And the Lord, he, he kind of, he sometimes, most times he tells Courtney stuff that we got to do before he tell me. <laughs> right? And Courtney started saying, like, babe, I think we got to move to Oakland. I was like, move to Oakland? They bipping. It's dangerous. The cost of living is higher. I don't got no job. My job and my business is here. What do you mean move to Oakland? And after he said it to her, he started digging on me. And he said, hey, you got to quit this job. I'm like, quit my job? No. No, I'm not quitting my job. And he like, yes, you are. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and what he says that, that, that made me have to move, he says, uh, you have to quit, lose this life that you have in order to get the life that I have for you. And if you don't do it, you can stay comfortable and stay here. But if you do, everything that I place inside of you is going to die here. All the gifts, all the talents, all the ideas, all the anointing is going to die if you remain comfortable. So that was enough for me. I said, Courtney, we go. We got <laughs> we gotta go, right? So this is this what I what I did, what we all do, is I say, All right, Lord, you can have a PE teaching job. I ain't really want that anyway, right? <laughs> I, I, was about tired. I was about tired of people asking me what you do, and I'd be like, oh, I teach people. They'd be like, oh, he's stupid. That's how, they, that's, that's how they act. They don't say that, but that's how they act. They'd be like, next, like, I'm moving, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. That's all that's in him, next. Right, so I'm like, Lord, you can have a PE job, but I'm going to keep the varsity program, basketball program, keep running it. It's a little bit more prestigious in the city, you know, local, local, you know. And then... Um, I'm also going to keep the basketball business. And Lord, I've been investing in this retirement. I don't think I'm a retired teacher. I'm going to pull that too. All right, so I'm going to pull that and uh, I'm going to invest. I'm going to do some investing, right? Some stocks, some real estate. And then I'm going to scale up this basketball business. And then the Lord said, no, you're not. You're not doing any of that. And um, I didn't give it to him. He actually forced me out. So uh, I gave up the teaching and... I had been sitting there for a while, but the Lord revealed that there was a Judas in my camp. So there was a there was a guy on my coaching staff who sang my praises, learned everything he can learn from me. Just super excited to be there the first year. He was losing, right? The first year. Second year, he starts winning. And now he's like, I want your spot. So he partners with a parent and uh, they just start telling all kind of lies. They start saying like, hey, he's not here for the kids. He's just here for a check. And I'm like, I'm here at 6 a.m. training the kids for free. How with with check? Right? No check. Right? So 
So, and then he said, yeah, he's messing up the, the business side of the accounts. Uh, he's actually taking money out of the accounts and then buying homes in Alabama. I don't own no property in Alabama. Right, and then he knew I had a skills training business because he watching me. This what this what the enemy do, right? This is what people around you do. They watch you and they fish you for information, right? So uh, he knew I had a training business. I was training the kids, right? They were getting better. It was good. It was a good time, right? He, him, and the parent went to the administrators at the school and they said, "Hey, do you know he's telling the kids that they don't train with him in his business and they won't make the school team?" And um, once those those the, that started getting back to me. I was just, I was just really hurt by that. And the part that really hurt me was that it just wasn't true. And my character was in question. And everything that he said I did, it was actually the opposite. Like, I cared more about the kids than I did about basketball. That's why I would stay early, late, pick them up, took them home, and talk to them about stuff other than basketball. I didn't take any money from the program. I invested thousands of our own money into it. All right, and... It was just, it was just hurtful because, and it, I really started to break and get angry uh, when I noticed that they, the people in the organization had heard the lies so much, right? And I was talking to Courtney and my other coach just saying like, hey, I'm about to, I'm about to go online. I'm going to make a video and I'm going to tell it all. Like, I'm going to just tell it. If we got to fight and scramble about it, this is what we're going to do with Courtney. Courtney and my coach was like, nah, you can't do that. You can't go down to that level. Right, but the part that hurt me was because I didn't say anything. I didn't offer the truth as an option to believe. People start to believe the lie, and it broke me when I started to see that uh, kids and families that I sacrificed a time, sacrificed time away from my family for, people that I served when I could have been serving my own family, people that I went out of my way for, start to believe the lie and align themselves with the enemy. That's the part that really broke me. And uh, I, was, I was hurt about it, but then the Lord began to minister to me, and he said, I know that was painful, but it was necessary. Yeah, you see, you see that, that, that gift of teaching and coaching that I've given you? Uh, I had to shut that down because I've called you to teach and coach my people. See, you thought it was coaching, it was really shepherding. And I can't allow you to be in that school giving all to these people who are not going to love you back anyway because the gift that I put inside of you is for hundreds. Like, so I have to train you to be a leader of leaders. Come out of there, let me, let me teach you how to be a coach of coaches. And that's what we're doing today. So I wanted to tell you that I know the enemy is saying, hey, this is what we do. We experience pain and suffering. We'd we'll be like, God, I'm out. And a lot that the enemy wants you to believe is that you are suffering and going through pain for no reason. And what I want to tell you today is that that's a lie. Sometimes you have to give up something good to receive something godly. All right, and I'll finish. I'll finish. If we could go back, if we could just go back to the parable of the sheep and the goat, we can get that on the screen. So, as, I, as the Lord is healing me, he's just showing me that because I gave my life, he's giving me a new one. And it's so much bigger than what you can imagine. Come on, you clap right there because I believe that's for you. So, and, and I want to I wanna close. I want to close here. I know we don't talk about this in church much anymore, but the Bible says that Jesus is coming back. Right? It says that at the end of the verse that we were looking back today, it said we'll be judged according to our deeds. It also says that in the parable of the sheep and the goat. And it says when we come back, we'll all be standing before him. And said, he said that he's going to separate the sheep from the goat. And if you hear you really resonate with this mission, you feel like, hey, uh, I've been living like a goat. This is what I want you to know. Uh, Jesus is a good shepherd. So the goats and the sheep, they lived in the same pen. But when a sheep, when a goat would get out, even though Jesus was a shepherd, he would go after it. So it doesn't matter what you've done. Uh, he knows you've, went your, you've gone your own way and you've forsaken him. But because he's a shepherd, he'll leave the 99 for the one. All right. 
and and here's here's here, here's the close. Uh, we have to understand that pain is unavoidable. It's actually inevitable. All right, and what we're looking at, what we're looking at is that do we want to experience pain on earth temporarily or pain in eternity forever? This is why Jesus said, I got to separate the sheep from the goat, right? So you can come home today, right? Lastly, I want to talk to the sheep. You in the house, you in the fold. And you resonate this message. You feel like you're living for the Lord. Uh, in the scripture, it says each one will be judged according to their deeds. So if you believe in Jesus, you accept him in your heart, you live for him. Your eternal salvation is secure. That's free. But sanctification comes at a cost. And Jesus is saying, he said at, at the end, he said, the sheep, uh, when you saw me hungry, you fed me. When I needed clothes, you clothed me. When I needed somewhere to stay, you took me in. So it's not a, it's not about deeds. It's about an inward heart posture. And when we live and we sacrifice and we suffer, what happens is our heart turns from being inward and on us and being selfish to being outward and being selfless. Amen.